Hi everyone, uh, this is Phil Travis, and um, this week uh, the lesson is on the Enlightenment and the scientific revolution, um, revolutions in science and philosophy. Um, the period between roughly, um, roughly 1600 to roughly 1800, um, obviously roughly, there's some bleed over each way, but this 200 or so year period is um, understood generally as the Enlightenment and also the period of the Scientific Revolution. These were periods in which humans fundamentally revolutionized how they thought about their physical existence in the cosmos and on Earth, and also how, how humans thought about government and justice and individual liberty in the world. So deeply influential development. Of course, astronomers really led the way when it came to the development of a changing understanding of the world. Uh, Nicholas Copernicus, who is in this in this painting here, of course, um, the Polish scientist who famously did what? Developed the concept of the heliocentric or the heliocentric theory, the Copernican system, if you will, um, which... Um, oppose the ideas of the church and of Ptolemy and of antiquity, which was uh, more or less the geocentric theory. So the ancients, the ancient philosophers, and this was co-opted by the church, um, had purported that the earth was the center of the universe as God's single creation. And Copernicus used um, his study of the skies to um, prove that, in fact, the earth went around the sun. And this was the beginning of a fundamental revolution in how we think about the cosmos in general. Johannes Kepler, of course, famously came up with the laws of planetary motion in which he found that the orbits of the planets were um, steady, unchanging, elliptical, and faster, closest to the sun. Um, Galileo, of course, probably the one that everybody knows, um, used his own telescope that he built from um, designs that he picked up when he was in the Netherlands, uh, used the telescope to first view the moons of Jupiter. Um, Galileo also helped develop the principle of inertia from his um, observations of the cosmos that all things in motion will remain in motion unless impeded by another force. Of course, you know, Galileo was a Catholic. Um, in fact, Galileo had been taught by a Jesuit. Um, so in some respects, you know, it, it seems as though from his standpoint, I mean, he was a Catholic. He was not doing this to uh, necessarily do damage to the church. But, of course, the implications for the church are pretty fundamental. The heavens are no longer the heavens. And in addition, the Catholic Church's authority over truth and falsity is fundamentally challenged. Because of this, Galileo is actually ultimately uh, put under house arrest in Italy. And um, Galileo ultimately dies under house arrest despite being a Catholic he was, um, he was placed under the greatest pressure to recant his findings by the Catholic Church and was effectively uh, labeled a heretic. Other great scientists, obviously not necessarily astronomy in this case, but great scientists who um, came up with theories that had great ramifications for um, how we understand the universe and the solar system uh, was, of course, Sir Isaac Newton. And Newton, most famously, of course, developed his natural laws of gravity. And you find these types of ideas in his greatest treatise, Principia. The New there was uh, an idea uh, proposed by Newton and really becomes known as the Newtonian conception of the universe. And this is effectively the way that people saw the universe really until the 20th century. And that was really the concept that the universe was perceived as like a machine. So the idea was that 
some kind of God created the universe as a machine, and then, of course, it would operate in a systematic way, um, in sort of a systematic and, and unchanging way, a machine-like way. Later in the 20th century, Einstein's theories of revolu re relativity have really revolutionized and, and changed how we understand the universe. We, we no longer um, look at the universe in a Newtonian sense. Instead, um, Einstein introduced the principle that the universe was, in fact, a chaotic place, moving um, rather than through a, a, a formalized machine-like structure, uh, the universe was, in fact, constantly moving towards ever greater entropy or chaos. And, of course, findings have shown that we believe the universe is expanding, and in that respect, the universe is a constantly changing and developing system, um, unlike the machine-like conception that was proposed by Newton. So we've, we've changed that thinking a little bit, but these are ideas that Einstein's theories fundamentally were built upon as physicists today are building their theories on the ideas of those before them. Women were actually um, a surprising part of the scientific revolution. Um, women were, of course, um, generally barred from the academy, so a woman could not get, a, get um, um, admitted into a major university to study. But nonetheless, many women uh, found ways to become involved in both the scientific revolution and the Enlightenment. Um, Margaret Chavendish in England, uh, first of all, you know, she was not only an astronomer, she was also, an, you know, an Enlightenment thinker who was famous for the, um, the utopian novel, The Blazing World. Uh, utopian novels, novels that proposed um, a kind of perfected form of existence in them um, were um, very, very famous at this time in history. As, as people are thinking about ways to effectively perfect and, and understand their, their civilization. Maria Winkelmann um, also was a German astronomer, and in fact, one in seven German astronomers were in fact women. Um, and there were also great uh, entomologists, entomologists who study um, insects, um, like Maria Marion, who went to Dutch Suriname, Suriname which is South America, to, uh, to study her subject. Nonetheless, at this time, unfortunately, even though we have this nice um, kind of uh, bright evidence of, of women breaking through the patriarchal bounds of society and, and breaking across the, the gender codes of the time, um, unfortunately, um, science will work purposely in a lot of respects against um, women's advancement and women's equality. Um, scientific uh, thinkers in, in many, many areas of the field actually use science, oftentimes doing purposely misleading research to reinforce the idea that women were inferior and were a weaker gender and therefore um, not uh, equipped for uh, governing, um, for university education and, and these types of things. Um, science, unfortunately, will... Um, for the next couple hundred years, use science to, rather than promote greater equality, to promote really profound falsities or, or fallacies, I should say, that women were, were, in, were, were inferior and also that other so-called races were, in fact, um, inferior. Um, race, in the way that we understand it today, race was an invention of a false pseudoscience during this period in which... Um, in which so-called scientists used, um, all, you know, generally um, um, bad, if not purposely manipulated, um, studies to suggest that each particular group of people in the world um, were adherent to a handful of races, and they subscribed uh, all these different characteristics to these races. And of course, in the 20th century and the 21st century, we are still working really hard to deconstruct. Um, these fallacies that were actually perpetrated during the scientific revolution. So um, we're making some positive moves forward during this time period, but there's also some uh, very negative um, steps backwards in the area of uh, equality between uh, genders and between uh, peoples of diverse ethnicities. 
the origin of modern science. So science is effectively the practice of, of observation and using observation to draw conclusions. Um, scientists are concerned with the empirical world, meaning the world that we can see, that we can feel, that we can touch and taste, the world that we can observe. They're interested in the material realm. And science generally um, goes about uh, providing a hypothesis, setting the hypothesis to some form of, of, of observable test and drawing conclusions about it, or sometimes inconclusive findings. The principle of modern science has its origins to the development in philosophy, uh, particularly with individuals like René Descartes. Um, René Descartes, um, who famously wrote his Discourse on Method, and postulated the well-known cogito ergo sum, this phrase that I think, therefore I am. René Descartes, in the Discourse on Method and the significance of the cogito ergo sum, was that René Descartes was wondering about how we know. How, in fact, do we have knowledge? Um, it seemed to Descartes that anything could be doubted, Skepticism is the practice of doubt, of doubting. And René Descartes felt that there was no way in his mind that he could verify that, in fact, his experience was, in fact, real, but not some kind of an illusion. And so he sought out um, a pursuit of how he could maybe find conclusive truth, universal truth, that he could know was, was absolutely accurate. He took a, a, a stance of full skepticism, doubting everything, and in the process um, subjects himself to a period of thoughts and questions and considerations on the topic. He ultimately determines that um, because he's a thinking ent entity, that he can trust that what he perceives is reality. Hence, I think, therefore I am. René Descartes, and actually the way in which he comes to this was a little bit, you know, curious. Uh, René Descartes ultimately, he, he believed in God, like, like many of these thinkers did. And he came to the position that um, he believed that since God could not be a malevolent genius who was tricking us, that um, only God had endowed us with the ability to think, and that there was in fact a non-material consciousness. And because God was not deceiving us, he could trust the observations of his non-material consciousness, his mind. And so Descartes proposes what becomes known as separation of mind and matter, or Cartesian dualism, uh, which was the idea that the mind was separate from the material world, and that the mind could be used to observe the material world and draw true deductions about it. Building on this, um, other thinkers like Francis Bacon um, created the basic idea of scientific method, um, which is basically the principle of induction. Induction basically means that you um, draw a hypothesis, or a, I'm sorry, draw a conclusion that because of observable evidence is able to go beyond merely the sample size that you looked at. So an example of this, this is basic scientific method. This is what scientists do. So a scientist has um, some findings about, let's say, a disease, and they test 100 subjects in the lab. And in testing the 100 subjects in the lab, they're able to um, get the substance on the Petri dish to react to a certain stimuli, let's say. They can then, they can, through induction, they can then conclude that, in fact, the same results are true for all other cases of that disease. And so the principle of induction is basically the idea of taking a sample size observation and inducing broad conclusions that relate to that observation. Other thinkers, David Hume, um, has, has brought doubt on what we can know about the reality of truth and falsity. Can we have David Hume's uh, big question is, can we ever have a, um, an absolute truth? And, um, you know, there's still some debate on how we can verify any kind of absolute truth. Um, other thinkers, um, Spinoza, 
who um, you know purported the the um, phenomenal concept that God and the world were sort of inseparable, and that would obviously be in contrast to Cartesian dualism, which suggested that the matter in the in the in the in, in the mind were separate, um, and. Of course, Spinoza's finding, you can imagine, was not received well by the church, as was the case for Galileo. And Hegel's a little bit later um, in the 19th century, and we'll talk a little bit more about him when we talk about Marxism. So, the Enlightenment... What is the Enlightenment? What do we mean when we, when, we, when we refer to this period of time? In short, we're talking about a group of political philosophers, as well as, as, well as other thinkers, who believe in using reason to find the natural organization of society, to perfect society. For these thinkers, Isaac Newton had used reason to find natural laws governing, governing the forces of physics and of the cosmos. Political philosophers like uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, like John Locke, Adam Smith, and Thomas Hobbes sought to use reason to find and understand the natural organization of society. One of the central premises and one of the things that they were particularly concerned with was the state of nature. Well, what was the state of nature? For some, um, the state of nature was very different. For some, like Thomas Hobbes, the state of nature was that humans are involved in a constant conflict. Um, and of course, when, when I say the state of nature, I mean they're thinking about what is the natural state of affairs among people. And that's a fundamental question and premise of, uh, of the Enlightenment. Thomas Hobbes, who um, posited things like his social contract, said that humans are involved in a constant conflict. And because of that, people should create stronger governments to maintain um, peace and stability. Effectively, effectively, the idea here was that if people did not have a government regulating them and controlling them, then they would war with each other to effectively take what each other has. And, and, and it would simply boil down to a strongest survive and that there would be no codes that, that held the society together. Hobbes and other um, thinkers of the Enlightenment posited the idea that either explicitly or implicitly humans sacrifice some of their freedoms to a government in exchange for security to deal with that state of nature. Other thinkers, though, like John Locke, for example, and Adam Smith falls into this category, posited the concept that inalienable rights natural rights that for a person like Locke sort of existed beyond the individual, that inalienable uh, divine natural rights, if you will, which should never be infringed upon by an authority, were somehow possessed by all people. And of course, that notion becomes fundamental in the um, United States Declaration of Independence, um, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, for Locke, it was life, liberty, and the pursuit of land. But in contrast to um, a Hobbesian perspective of things, in which it would be posited that you need a stronger government to prevent the fundamental conflicting nature, um, thinkers like John Locke and Adam Smith said you need a small government that will allow the state of nature to operate in harmony. Thinkers like Locke and, and Adam Smith basically say that uh, powerful governments muddy up the natural harmony of things and cause uh, injustice and problems. So Adam Smith, Adam Smith famously wrote his Wealth of Nations, and this came out um, in the uh, time of the American Revolution, um, and this was part of a debate in um, in societies, in developing societies like those in the United States and in England particularly. Um, between the concept, and this is similar to like what we talked about with the social contract versus 
the Lockean understanding, um, there was a debate between the public good in which there was an idea that these new states, like Enlightenment thinkers are, are basically putting together the framework for fundamentally new ways of governing. And the, the, the way that really comes out as the best way is, in fact, representative society, representative republics. And over the long term, that, that model of government, that, soci- that individuals in society have um, a representative voice in their government, um, that becomes a fundamental premise in the founding of the modern world. And it's really the Enlightenment that unhatches that, um, that concept of, of representative society, of republics. And that republics which can then uphold um, the natural rights that are uh, somehow possessed by all individuals. Um, at this time, we have a debate where some individuals promote, uh, and this is going on in the United States, by the way, uh, at its founding, that, that there's a responsibility of republics to maintain the public good. And in the Constitution of the United States, of course, it says that the government has a responsibility to maintain the general welfare. That's one of the first things the Constitution says, actually. And the way that this would be done would be through regulation of trade um, and other forms of economic activity, taxation. Basically, you take measures to ensure overall public well-being. Adam Smith led um, a movement of individuals that really promoted um, the opposite of that. So they were on the other side of the coin. Adam Smith promoted a laissez-faire capitalism. Laissez-faire basically means free market economy. Um, It effectively in French means something to the effect of, of let them be free. Um, in, in Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, he promoted the idea of the invisible hand in which he proposed that private capitalism um, and economics and economic freedom was effectively a natural law. And that if you allowed the system to just operate, capitalism to just operate, that the product would necessarily be a just system. Um, this is the fundamentals of free market economics. And so you have arguments going on on both sides of the fence. And, and this goes for um, concepts of justice and liberty, natural rights, and also down to economic freedom. And um, I think it's fair to say that neither side is truly right. Um, the reality is, is that if you just let, if you look at Adam Smith's understanding of capitalism, um, capitalism really is not itself a natural law. Um, and private capitalism and in economic freedom, complete economic freedom without regulation, as this has been proven by history, if you just leave it alone, everything's not going to be fixed. Like it's not if you if you if you consider justice to be related to equality, to educational opportunity, to a lack of poverty, these types of things, um, that is not what results from that kind of a system. Um, instead, what happened through the history of the country was the. Um, expansion of a gap between rich and poor, the growth of inequality um, in many cases, um, and the in the consolidation of increasingly huge amounts of wealth in the hands of just a few people. And so, you know, in, in, in many respects, Adam Smith is really wrong in the wealth of nations. Um, if you just let the system function as it did, um, then the result ultimately would not be a Uh, just and fair system. Now, to be fair to Adam Smith, he could not have foreseen the development of industrial capitalism and how that changed things. Um, And so Matt, Adam Smith has a very idealistic understanding of the subject, and it's not to, it's not to just write it off, but it's just that he could not really see the long-term course that a free market economic approach would take. Um, similarly, similarly, uh, the other side of the equation, um, there are problems with the stronger government approach. Um, obviously, when it comes to liber- uh, when it comes to um, infringements upon people's um, basic freedoms of, of 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 justice and so forth. So you can see that the Enlightenment is really, in a lot of respects, devoted to perfecting society, but everybody doesn't always agree. Um, and there's generally a debate between, um, during this coming out of this time period as well, you see this go on through in the 1800s, a debate, in a lot of respects, a debate still happening today, that uh, a debate between do you, have, do you allow natural 
systems. First of all, are natural systems natural systems, right? It's debatable whether or not um, private capitalism is actually uh, a natural law, right? It's also highly debatable that um, people actually in truth possess kind of beyond our existence, um, you know, natural rights of some kind. Um, most scholars believe that these types of things are given to us by a government. And so you see a debate between the natural order of things and the role of government that develops during the Enlightenment. And some figures promote a stronger government to maintain a balance in society. Others say you need a looser government, a, a, a weaker government, to allow the natural laws that govern society and people's natural rights to, um, uh, to be maximized effectively, to create justice in society. You know, some on the last, on the slide before this, I had a picture of Immanuel Kant. Immanuel Kant is one of the greatest thinkers of the age. He was a Prussian, and he was an, an ethical theorist. Um, Immanuel Kant, he believed that effectively, just like, in, in a way, just like these other thinkers like Locke and, and, and Adam Smith, who believe that there is a natural law, or Thomas Hobbes, who believe there's a natural state of nature that we have to interact with, uh, or that is the natural state of being. Immanuel Kant believed that there was a natural, uni universal duty ethic that was beyond humans, and, and but was yet bi binding on all humans. Um, and he believed that that he could use reason to locate that, and he and he and he does, and he explains um, the various methods and how it works. The so-called categorical imperative, the concept of never using someone as a means to an end. Um, so, you know, it's not just political and economic philosophers. Uh, you also have, um, you know, famous philosophers of ethics like Immanuel Kant, who's also effectively positing a natural law of ethics. Um, so uh, the Enlightenment was, was in many cases the use of reason to find these natural organizational principles of society and then to use those to create more just and fair governments. I hope this is pretty clear, guys. Um, you know, please email me. Let me know if you have any questions.